This is episode 55 of Cinescope. And not everyone can become a great artist, but a great artist can come from anywhere. Welcome to Cinescope, where our goal is not to criticize or to assign ratings, but rather to celebrate the movies we love, exploring story, characters, music, and relevance to the world around us. I'm your host, Chad Hopkins, and joining me today is Blaine Grimes to talk about one of our favorite films, Ratatouille. Blaine, how are you doing? I am really excited to talk about this movie with you, so thank you a bunch for having me on. I'm always up for talking about (laughs) Brad Bird. I'm so glad to have you back on. I don't remember exactly what episode number we talked about Iron Giant on, but it's been a a good long while, another Brad Bird film, as it were. And so it it only seemed fitting that we had you back to do this one. We did Tomorrowland a few weeks back, and you (laughs) were almost a little bit grumpy with me when I was talking (laughs) about uh, Brad Bird without you, so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's okay when you told me that i could pick the movie for this i think i pretended like i was deciding for maybe two minutes before i put ratatouille out so <laughs> but really that was it <laughs> as soon as you told me i could pick well how about you reintroduce us to who you are what you do all that kind of stuff before we get into the movie itself sure i am a podcaster i guess i have several different podcasts now i'll talk about those more at the end. Um, you probably know me, if you if you know me at all from anything, it's probably from Real World Rewind, um, which is part of the Real World Theology Group. And so I know there's a lot of overlap. We have a lot of common listeners. So that's probably where you know me from if you do. And um, I also write reviews there and I write some reviews for Christ and pop culture. So um, I love talking about movies and other pop culture things. Excellent. Uh, yeah, definitely go check out Blaine's stuff over on Real World Theology and Real World, and Real World Rewind. And we'll mention other places where you can find him at the end of the show. And uh, I, I always enjoy everything Blaine does. And having him on this show, it's always a treat. So I'm ready to talk Brad Bird if you are. Yes, let's do it. Okay, so this is Ratatouille. We decided we'd go for a sort of pseudo Disney month, starting with Tomorrowland and last week's A Goofy Movie. And now Ratatouille. And next week, I think we're going with Tangled. Uh, so be excited about that. But this movie was released on June 29th of 2007 and was directed by Brad Bird, who's known for directing The Iron Giant, The Incredibles, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, Tomorrowland, and the upcoming Incredibles 2. It was also written by Bird, and the music is by Michael Giacchino. And believe it or not, this is a truncated filmography for Mr. Giacchino from the last time we read them out. So here we go. The Incredibles, Mission Impossible 3, Ratatouille, Star Trek, Up!, Cars 2, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, John Carter, Star Trek Into Darkness, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Inside Out, Star Trek Beyond, Doctor Strange, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, Spider-Man Homecoming, War for the Planet of the Apes, and is set to compose for the upcoming Pixar films Coco and The Incredibles 2. Wow. This movie stars Patton Oswalt, Ian Holm, Lou Romano, Brad Garrett, Janine Garofalo, Brian Dennehy, Peter O'Toole, Peter Sohn, Will Arnett, and John Ratzenberger. So (laughs) how about you start us off, Blaine? What was your first experience with Ratatouille? I saw Ratatouille in the theater. I was a older teenager at the time. And at the time that I saw, normally I remember who I see movies with in the theater. I have no recollection at all of who I saw Ratatouille with, probably family, because that's usually when I got into my upper teens, that's usually who I went to see these animated films with, um, especially in the summer or around Thanksgiving or Christmas or something like that. But I was actually fairly lukewarm on Ratatouille the first time I saw it. I, I didn't dislike it. I didn't really love it. I just thought, okay, that was that was a movie that I saw, and it was cute and fun and whatever. And full confession, though, this was before I became a cinephile. It, this was probably right on the the early end of me starting to get interested in in film in a deeper way, and so I wasn't really looking at films thoughtfully. I wasn't looking at them formally or anything like that, and so I just kind of watched movies to watch movies at at that point and didn't really think about them much beyond their sort of immediate entertainment value. Um, so that that was my initial reaction to to Ratatouille. I don't know. Do you have a similar story? Pretty similar, except a few years 
after that, you know, I, I didn't see this one in theaters. I think the first, I, I'd, I'd of course grown up with Toy Story and with Monsters, Inc. And uh, to a certain extent, Finding Nemo, except I didn't see that until later even. Uh, but I didn't really get into Pixar movies until really Wally the following year after Ratatouille. Mm. And so Ratatouille, I didn't see it fully all the way through. I might have caught snippets or so on TV, but I didn't see it all the way through until probably my freshman or sophomore year of college. Um, I got a Pixar box set on Blu-ray when I was first building out my collection and it came with that. So I finally was able to sit down and watch it from start to finish. And uh, over the years, I have maybe rewatched it once or twice, but even today there were things watching the film. I didn't remember because I just haven't seen it enough, which is a real shame because Mm. it is a fabulous film. And it, I mean, I wouldn't expect anything less from Brad Bird now, knowing who he is and what he's done in the past. And I did like the movie at the beginning, but I think sort of the hang up people have with the film initially is just the basic premise. I mean, the Mm -hmm. idea of a chef being controlled by a rat who knows how to cook. I mean, on paper, (laughs) that's a a little absurd even for a Pixar movie. Uh, It's just not something you would expect. But when you get into it and you start looking at the characters and th- their their motivations, their dreams, what they're aspiring to be and the expectations they're struggling against, it really becomes a lot more than just this gimmick. And yeah. the gimmick is actually just such a small part of what the movie is. I, I really like how th- there's so much more depth to it than the premise suggests. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And this is a movie that has grown on me more and more over the years, as you might expect. I mean, Brad Bird is one of my favorite living directors. I love Brad Bird. I love everything he has done. And this is a film that has meant more and more to me on a personal level um, as I've started doing some film criticism and some film podcasting and stuff. But I'm sure I'll talk about that more later. But yeah, this is a movie that I that I rewatch more often as the years go by, too. And I don't know the the viewings that I, I've seen it quite a few times in the past year or two, actually showing family members and then just watching it on my own and, and, and whatnot. And it's actually a fairly emotional watch for me anymore. Um, oddly enough. And maybe we'll parse out why towards the end of this, but yes, this film has grown on me quite a bit. I don't know that there is another Pixar film that has grown on me this much. And like I said, I did, it wasn't that I didn't like it when I saw it in theaters the first time. It just come to mean mean more to me. And that's something cool that movies do is they they grow on you with your as your own life experiences and situations and circumstances change. Um, so do the movies that you watch. Agreed. And you know, it's funny. I, I won't talk about it too much, but with all the the drama that happened today on uh, Twitter with mm-hmm. uh, Cinema Sins and the idea of film criticism and what exactly criticism means and what it should entail and all that kind of stuff. I, I was watching this movie after all of that was happening and then looking back on just the premise of Cinescope and the idea that we're talking about movies we love because we love them and not because they're flawless, but because we can celebrate their victories. And so watching this movie and its presentation of the notion of criticism and what exactly that means and what a critic is and what he does, it really does sort of lend to a more touching moment with me as well. I I mean, I'm not afraid to say ever that I teared up during a movie or that I even shed a tear during a movie because I think that letting films affect you is letting yourself experience them fully. Mm -hmm. And this movie, whether, I mean, it's not like a heavy love story. It doesn't feature these dramatic death sequences. It it's not emotional or deep on that level. It's just the, 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 goals and the lessons that you can take away and as you said our life experience and the way it fits in uh that can make it just as emotional as anything from another more heavy drama i can tell we are going to be sharing some very similar thoughts and ideas um, (laughs) when we discuss theme later on so yeah well let's go ahead and dive into the story so just basic general story stuff what do you got well, sure. I mean, this uh, Ratatouille strikes me as a distinctly Brad Bird story, which is kind of a funny thing to say because Ratatouille is probably the second most famous Pixar <laughs> uh, film for uh, that was known for having, or infamous, I guess you could say, for having a lo- quite a bit of production problems or pre-production problems, as it were. I guess um, The Good Dinosaur probably has more ill repute because of because of that now or maybe even brave oh yeah brave i forget about brave yeah yeah 
so but at any rate um ratatouille is known for these these production problems and brad bird was specifically brought in because the pixar heads were not happy with the way um the story was shaping up before the film was about to go into production uh jan pinkova was slated to be the director and it was Jan Pinkova's idea. This, this entire thing was Jan Pinkova's idea, his original concept and everything. But the story just wasn't meshing together the way Pixar wanted it to. And Pixar has always been all about story or story first, a very story centered studio. And so they brought Brad Bird in to sort of fix it. And he did. He did. It's interesting. You mentioned the, uh, the idea that maybe turns some people off of this film uh, this crazy idea of a rat being in a kitchen or a rat who can cook. And that's exactly what Brad Bird says he was drawn to. He loved this idea of a rat that cooks. It just sounded, he says it sounded insane to him and something he couldn't resist you know, taking up the mantle for. And so Bird made a number of changes that I think make for a very strong film. And we don't, we don't have Jan Pinkova's script to my knowledge, right? Uh, I'm sure there's some version of it out there, but I doubt we're ever going to get to see it. But we do know from what Brad Bird has said uh, that some of the changes he made, I just can't imagine what the film would have been like before. Bird said that he killed off Gusto. Originally, Gusto was going to have a much, play a much bigger role in this film and not just kind of be a dead ghost or figment of Remy's imagination. And another thing that Bird did that I think makes this movie really stand out from a, crowd, a crowded field of animal-centered films is he made the rats less anthropomorphic. Um, so originally, I think Jan Pinkova was going to put them up on two legs and they were going to look a little bit more human and act a little bit more human. But Bird thought it was important to put them on four legs so that Remy's decision to stand up would make him stand out from the crowd and maybe even make him a little bit more easy to empathize with. And I think that was a really good decision considering we've had a ton of Disney films, many of which I love, but that basically make animal characters human. Uh, even Zootopia, a recent example of that. It's not that overly humanized animal characters are necessarily bad, but we've had a lot of films like that. Uh, I think this I think Ratatouille is a little different because of this decision to make the rats like rats. Um, and it never loses sight of that. A bird also added in parts about Gusto's will. So, and, and I'll talk more about the, the whole Gusto's will bit later on. And he also separated the character Remy from his, from his family for the majority of the film. Originally they were going to sort of be together and Remy would just sneak off to do his thing. But, I think separating Remy from his family is a crucial part of helping the character along in his search for authenticity. But I've been talking a whole lot about these changes. Um, so I'll pause and let you chime in. <laughs> no, that's fascinating. I to get me. carried yeah. away. <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating to me. I wasn't aware of all of those uh, specific changes. I just hadn't, I didn't dive into all the, the pre-production kind of stuff before. So I'm glad you're here to share that because it really is interesting. You can definitely see the Brad Bird touch in every single one of those changes. And uh, I really especially like the idea of all the other rats being strictly rats and then Remy being the one anthropomorphized because he, he's got a bit of an identity crisis. And mm -hmm. we'll talk about that more when we get to character discussion in particular. But uh, that change uh, alone is just monumental in separating both the Remy from the other rats and then this film from uh, a franchise or a, a studio in which uh, human-like animals are the norm. So I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, just the way this movie starts, we start looking at this TV and it's like this advertisement for Gusto, and it's talking about his philosophy, about this idea of how anyone can cook. And so we've right off the bat, we've got this premise for the movie, this idea that anyone can cook before mm -hmm. we know that rats are involved before we know anything like that. We, the, the idea is that anyone can cook, but ego shows up and he says, no, I don't think anyone can cook and boom, mm -hmm. you've got your movie right there. That's what this movie is tackling. This idea of, uh, anyone being able to accomplish greatness and the contrasting idea that no, not anybody can. 
And I really mm-hmm. like that. And then from there, we uh, the, the very first shot we get is Remy jumping out of the, the window with the book in his hands. Uh, so it, it's this really cool way to introduce a movie. And then all of a sudden, it sort of subverts your expectations. Like if somehow you walked into this movie not knowing they're going to be talking rats, mm-hmm. the, the first couple of minutes don't really give that away until we see Remy jumping out of the window. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> I love that as well. I also am a... I'm a big fan of Bird's optimism. I think sometimes Brad Bird gets criticized for being an overly optimistic filmmaker, but I find his optimism really encouraging and his emphasis on creativity. I'm going to save that a little bit more for when we discuss themes, but I'll just say that I, I find him to be very authentic um, and, and a lot more nuanced than maybe he gets credit for in exploring optimism and exceptionalism and all those things. But I also love Brad Bird's camera work, which seems like a, a weird thing to talk about with an animated film, but really directing a uh, CG film is not that different from directing a live action film, except in the sense that it's all being done on the computer. But the director's choices are still very much there, and and camera and the director's filming decisions are, are still very much relevant and and a thing, for lack of a, a better word. <laughs> but um, I really. I'm attracted to how bird creates longer takes that feel very natural and organic because he creates shots within a longer shot. So for instance, one of the things Brad bird loves to do is he loves to have a single shot, a longer shot, a long take, and he likes to move to three different points of action in a particular, in one particular shot, but he creates a different focal point for each of those three centerpieces. It really is usually three, although not always. Um, but he does this and creates three different focal points so that it's not distracting. Uh, if you look at Bird's camera in both his animated and his live action films, it's almost always moving. But it's not this like herky-jerky handheld camera stuff. Um, it's very smooth. Um, and he does something that's very reminiscent of, of Spielberg. Spielberg is great at doing that too, making long takes that aren't distracting. And I think I like that so much because far too often it seems like in in Hollywood films long takes are used any more to draw attention to the director. This is one of my criticisms of Joe Wright as a director um who Hannah Atonement um slipping on any other films that he's directed. But he likes to do a lot of long takes but they're usually Oh, Pride and Prejudice, of course. There's the long, there's the long take at the ballroom, but it usually feels like it's a little bit pretentious. He's trying to draw attention to himself as a director, and Bird never feels like he's doing that. His long takes always feel like they're serving the story, um, and really you know, creating an interesting dynamic or attention or making really interesting compositions. So, I really like the way Bird uses his his camera. And another thing, while we're talking about story. I love the decision to add that sort of abstract animation that accompanies Remy when he's smelling food. It, it happens two or three times. It happens to Remy and it happens to a meal. And I think it happens one other time, but there are just these sort of abstract sort of usually the, the, the background behind a character will, um, will be completely black. And then these little abstract sort of splotches will, will show up as they're, as they're smelling food. And, I really love that. I feel like that's a a very clever and perfect way to embody what creativity feels like, which is one of this film's main thematic uh, considerations. I can talk more about a couple (laughs) of different scenes that I like and everything, but I'm going to stop again. (laughs) Just cut me off when I start talking too much. Again, no, I I like it. It's for the benefit of the audience. They're going to like it too. Um, I I love that you mentioned the, the burst of creativity in the background because I forgot to make note of it. Uh, But it's, even cool to see how it contrasts between Remy and Emil. Uh, when mm-hmm. Remy does it at the start of the film, it's it's very vibrant and it's very colorful and it's instant. Whereas when Emil is trying to do it later in the film, the persistence of Remy is it's muted. It's it's slower yeah. to move. It's it's more faint in the background. But as it goes on, it, it does brighten a little bit and then it sort of just dissipates as he he's a rat he doesn't care so much but it, yep. it's cool to to have that idea present within two different characters and for them to experience it completely differently but that same idea to still be there uh and as for all the camera work stuff 
Brad Bird also uses perspective really well, I think, in this film, mm-hmm. especially when you have uh, something like a rat compared to a human, especially a human as tall as Linguini. So you have uh, Remy's perspective from the ground. You have Linguini's perspective. You have Remy's perspective from atop Linguini's head. And uh, mm-hmm. the, the the camera is placed in each of those perspectives at different parts of the film so that you can really sort of experience the environment as that character. So it's it's a mm-hmm. really cool use of camera techniques and it's 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 an example of something you can really do more in animation than you can in live action not that live action films haven't done it before but it just is pulled off so fluidly in this animated film by brad bird and uh those long takes again it's just brad bird's a master no matter what medium you put him in i think and just speaking to the the idea of optimism as you said we'll talk about that more in depth later but I couldn't help to be, be reminded, you know, I watched tomorrow, rewatched Tomorrowland just a few weeks ago, and these same ideas of optimism and creation and perseverance mm-hmm. are present in that film too. And so having Brad Bird as sort of this arbiter of optimism in a medium like this, it, it's just so fantastic, especially yeah. when it's, it's geared towards children, the people we really need to be inspiring, and that he mm-hmm. does that so unabashedly. Absolutely. This is, I think Ratatouille is maybe the Brad Bird film that sort of gets left off as not really a Brad Bird film because he came in later in the pre-production process. Um, but again, we talked about it already. And when we talk about themes and characters and stuff, we're going to see like this is thoroughly a Brad Bird movie. His his mark is all over everything here. But I also have to say that I really appreciate the kitchen scenes, especially the the first kitchen scene in Gusto's restaurant. Um, another decision that that Bird made when he came on uh, in the late in the pre-production process was to actually take the crew and they went to Paris and they went and they learned from actual chefs, watched chefs and uh, work in the kitchen in Paris. And I think that really comes through, especially in that first scene where Remy is looking down over the kitchen. I worked a, a, as in a restaurant as a waiter and briefly, very briefly as a cook. Uh, for a for a period of time way back when I started college. And I think this film does a wonderful job capturing the chaos of a meal of of a dinner rush or a lunch rush at a restaurant. I mean, when customers start to come in, everybody just starts running around, you're grabbing things. You're not really talking with the people you're working with that much, but you're just moving and doing. And it, and it looks like sheer chaos, and, it, and frankly, it feels like chaos <laughs> at times when you're working in those situations. But Usually on a good day, and especially if you've got a lot of people who there who know what they're doing and who are experienced, it's a very organized chaos. And a kitchen can run like a very well-oiled machine and should run like a well-oiled machine. And honestly, this sounds weird, but it's actually kind of a beautiful thing to see. I'm a person who likes organization and order. And I think it can be beautiful. And I think this sort of beautiful chaos of a kitchen at rush time is a kind of metaphor for the a larger metaphor for the filmmaking process. Really any creative process though, that it is kind of a beautiful chaos. It can feel chaotic. It can feel like you lose sight of your ultimate goal. But if you keep pushing ahead, you keep working hard, you can you can come out of it just fine. Or even great sometimes with a lot of tips. It's like clockwork. It's all these little pieces that are meshed together in this tight space and they, they just happen to link up exactly the right way to, to make something beautiful. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I like that as well. I, I made note of that because, you know, with any Pixar film, they're going out there and they're doing their research for Finding Nemo. They go out to the Great Barrier Reef and they, they get in the water and they look and they, they make note of exact details that they can then recreate. They do mm-hmm. that with uh, A Bug's Life even uh, way back in 98. Yep. And it, it, they've, they've done it countless times since. Uh, so I knew watching this movie today, I had like a brief thought. I wonder how accurate this is. And then I almost just immediately brushed it aside because I know Pixar and I know that it's going to be as faithful as they can with some creative license, I'm sure. But as mm-hmm. as accurate as possible to to make sure that they're really portraying the environment as it would be presented in real life. And it, it's, as you said, beautiful, organized chaos. Yeah, I think one other story thing that I that I very much appreciate that I think lesser films have and and would maybe sort of leave on the table. I love that at the end of the film, Gusto's restaurant has to come has to get shut down or that it gets shut down. I mean, it makes sense. The and and Remy even says it sort of in a jokingly self-aware line. He says, well, we had to let Skinner and the health inspector go. (laughs) We couldn't leave them in that. We couldn't leave them locked up in the freezer. 
you know, till they died or whatever. Um, they had to let them go. And of course they turned them in. Um, so it makes sense that it had to close. It makes that ending. I mean, this film has a happy and an optimistic ending, but it's not so overly syrupy that just everything works out perfectly. Right. The story makes sense, right? This it's a small attention to detail that someone like, you know, Brad Bird is not going to overlook. And I feel like because then they end up working at the restaurant that ego fronts the money for, basically it gives his character a little bit more of a complete arc. I just think it makes the whole story better. Um, even though it's just a tiny detail, I appreciate that quite a bit. Yeah. Whether a colony of rats makes me a delicious meal or not, it's still a colony of rats. <laughs> and I don't know <laughs> if I'd be okay with them continuing business. <laughs> right. So yeah, I like that as well. Uh, are you ready to go ahead and move on to characters? Yeah, let's let's talk about some characters. Okay, let's just start with Remy. What do you have to say about Remy? Remy is Remy's a character that I relate to in one sense and don't relate to in another sense. Uh, Remy sort of has this natural talent, this natural creative talent that or the skill that sort of lets him be creative. It doesn't mean he doesn't have to work to become a good chef because that's one of the big big themes running throughout the film is it, it takes work to achieve greatness, even if you have a natural knack for it. And I guess that's the sense in which I don't relate to Remy is I've never, aside from writing, I've never really felt like I've just been tremendously skilled at a lot of things. It usually feels like it takes more and more work. And then even writing good grief. Like it takes work every single day, every single week. And I'm never going to feel like I've gotten to where I want to be as a writer or as a podcaster um, or anything like that. And if I think if you do feel like you get there, you stagnate and you're deceiving yourself. One, you also stagnate <laughs> and you're not going to get any better. But Remy just seems to have a natural talent that I feel like I've always had to, I was never a naturally athletic kid, right? I, I was never just like immediately musically inclined or anything like that. But like I've had to work for a lot of these different things and it's been good, but it makes me relate to Remy maybe a little bit less. I don't know. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I, I definitely see where you're coming from. I'm a musician, obviously. And going through middle and high school, I, I will say I, I had a lot of natural talent for my instrument. But then mm -hmm. when I got to college, it's exactly what you're saying. You, you stagnate to a certain extent because you get used to or you get comfortable in being how you are and you don't work as hard to improve. And so that was something when I got to college that I really had to work at. I really had to spend time in the practice room and I really had to work very hard in order to make any sort of progression because all of a sudden I was in an environment where everybody cared about music. And so it was almost a power struggle to to get anywhere. And that's exactly what is going on with Remy. He, he is naturally talented, but he's also struggling because of who he is and what he is. So I talked about how I how I don't relate to him in some sense but i do relate to him very i mean his, he's a character who is struggling to be himself or trying to find sort of what makes him uniquely remy because he wants to please his parents and his family but he also really wants to be a cook and is gifted to be able to do that that's certainly something that i can resonate with and i think anybody who does any sort of creative work can resonate with is sometimes people sometimes it's family sometimes it's friends but everybody has someone in their life who just, just doesn't really understand or appreciate what they're doing. And you feel like you kind of want to please them or you're maybe not being loyal to your friend or your family if you're, if you're pursuing this other endeavor. And then as you struggle to pursue this endeavor, you're trying to please other people a lot of times. You're, you're trying to follow the recipe, <laughs> to use an analogy from the, from the film. But you try to have to be true to yourself, right? You, the only thing you can do to be a good artist, we'll talk about more, is, is, is be absolutely authentic and try to create the, the work that only you can create. Um, so I certainly resonate with Remy in that struggle and don't feel like I've <laughs> been able to do that fully yet. Don't feel like I've arrived there either. So yeah. It's an identity crisis for Remy. He, he's struggling with who he is versus who he wants to be. And then mm -hmm. the expectations and limitations that go with each of those things, whether it's being a rat versus being a human. Uh, so working with Linguini, allows him to be both to a certain extent, but it has its own problems because mm -hmm. uh, he's spending more time with humans and that, that leads to a sort of a tear with his family because he's not spending more time with his family. And then mm -hmm. later in the film, when he becomes jealous of Linguini's attention to the detriment of his own, he can't share in that spotlight for very obvious reasons. 
and that leads to a tear in their relationship. And so it's really not until that moment when he's locked in the cage and he's struggling with his figment of gusto and he understands that he can't be both. He can't even really be one or the other. He's He can only be who he is. And to him, that's a chef. He's Remy. He's Remy the chef. And mm-hmm. that that was his growth throughout the film. He spent time being a rat. It really didn't suit him. He spent time being a a puppeteer basically and that really didn't suit him either because he wasn't being himself he was being himself through somebody else and that's not the same thing and so it was only when he was able to accept himself and be himself that his arc was completed yeah absolutely just speaking of the the idea of Gusteau's presence in this film, one, it's a fantastic performance from Brad Garrett. It's not really the the typical role mm-hmm. that goes to him. He does a lot of voice work, but it's always the Brad Garrett voice uh, and not this fun French caricature almost that yeah. he is. And it, it's really fun. And just the idea that Gusteau is this extension of Remy and it's a way for him to to confront his own fears and a way to challenge his own thinking and it's a really cool way to to show the struggle he's having within himself it's funny because i don't think of him as brad garrett in in this performance like you said normally i'm able to pick him out but here every time i watch the movie almost i have to go and look it up on imdb and like who's who's voicing this character i'm the same way i don't think i would have known if i didn't look at the cast list either i really appreciate anton ego as a character I love Peter O'Toole's performance. There's one time in the film, I, w- I, I can't think of the exact line right now because I want to quote it, but he says popular and he makes the P pop so much as he says it. It's just so fantastic, so menacing. And I love the way he is designed as a character. I mean, usually characters who are villains are more angular, but I mean, Ego is almost all angles very sharp angles um he's got the nose he's his face is triangular he's always looking down at people um so i love the design of his character he's really portrayed as a vampire which is funny because he he even has a coffin shaped office there are a couple of overhead shots of his office and his office is or I don't know if it's his office. It's the study or whatever where he's usually sitting when his butler comes in. But it's shaped exactly like a coffin. I did not notice that. I'll have to go rewatch pretty soon so I can find that. Yeah, it's funny because he really, I mean, it matches up with his personality. He's a character who literally sucks the life out of everything, at least for most of the film. So so Ego is a, is a fun character. I think he's one of the more interesting villains we get. At different times in the movie, he's everything that is great and everything that is awful about criticism in any mm-hmm. medium. But where I relate to him is when he says he, he doesn't like food. He loves food. Movie critics mm-hmm. don't like movies or they don't love to hate on movies. They love movies. That's why they're making a career out of it. And that's the same with Ego here. He He's a food critic because he loves food. And he admits, yes, it's fun to write a cruel review. It's fun to tear down these restaurants. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, he'd love nothing more than to be surprised with a spectacular dish. And that's what happens in the movie. Mm -hmm. And it's just really cool to have this character who really just sort of epitomizes to me what criticism really is. Yes, Mm -hmm. he's a cruel character at times, but ultimately, he loves food. And that's why he's a food critic. And that's why anybody is a critic of anything. It's because they love something and evaluating what you consume, whether it's food, whether it's movies or books or any anything else, it means that you love it and you want it to improve. So yep. I like Ego a lot as well. Yeah. And then, I mean, of course, there's Luigi who, uh, or sorry, Luigi. <laughs> That'd be a very different, uh, but, um, but Linguini, Brad Bird always has an underdog character. And I'll talk about this more here in a bit, but Linguini is our underdog character. He doesn't have the cooking talent. He is the lowest of the low on the totem pole in the restaurant. He's taking out garbage. But the great thing about Linguini is that he he really does have, a, overall, he has a pretty good attitude about his position. He has no problem supporting those and learning from those who, who can do better than him. 
Um, and I, I really like that he isn't just downcast and mopey the, the entire movie. He has periods where he gets like that, but, but overall he, he can support those who have the talent and who have, you know, who are above him on the food chain, so to speak. Um, but he just doesn't have that. He has to work a lot harder. And so I guess that's where I identify a little bit more with Linguini because I've always seen myself sort of as someone who maybe doesn't have the natural talent that a lot of other people have for certain things. So. Um, yeah, I like Linguini. Just like Remy, he's struggling with expectations thrust upon mm-hmm. him the whole movie. First, as a garbage boy, nobody expects him to be of any worth. Second, once he first shows that he can cook, he struggles to keep up with the expectation of having to be consistent. Yep. And then third, in the final act of the film, when it's revealed that he's Gusto's son, everyone expects him to be the talent that his father was. And he can't measure up to any of those because that's not who he is. He He is a support role, and that's okay to be a support role. He just can't keep up with this facade of having Remy cook for him. And it's not until he's honest with his staff and with Colette that he's able to be himself. Yes, they abandon him and probably for right reasons. Mm -hmm. But Colette comes back because one, she believes in Gusteau's motto and it was not the first time she's defended it but also because she cares about him and she uh, saw that he was himself. And then when, when Remy is cooking everything up, he says, okay, I can fall into the support role because that is what I'm good at. That is my talent is mm-hmm. to, to be there and to support people and to just be there as a, as a support. I, I really can't think of another better word, mm-hmm. uh, but that that's, there's nothing wrong with that. And then Colette, she's a hard worker who's, just trying to prove that she is where she belongs because she worked incredibly hard and she was very tough. I mean, all, all of our characters at the forefront here are struggling with expectations that the world and other people have put upon them. Um, but despite this, she's still caring and she's helpful. Uh, she shows Linguini Leropes so that he may be successful. And even though she's a strict teacher, she even makes death threats if Linguini doesn't follow the rules of the kitchen. But she she compliments him when he deserves it. When he's done well, when he's made improvement, she's there to to encourage him and to let him know that she supports him. It's it's not an entirely antagonistic relationship and all of a sudden she falls for him. It, it's it's always coming from a place of helping to improve. Uh, you said that better than, than I could, so I won't add anything to that. <laughs> Uh, anything to say about Skinner? I will say, if there's a character who <laughs> isn't as interesting to me in this film, it's Skinner. And, and I get the, the the role that he has to play is, you know, a sort of very direct ad, um, antagonist to Remy and uh, Linguini. But I don't know. I found we get so little of his of his character that he he almost just sort of seems like a bit of a two on the nose villain for me personally. But um, I do love (laughs) I do think he's a fun character to watch. Um, I love that he's so short and I love watching him him bop around. Um, And, you know, he's he has a huge ego, even though he's he's a very, you know, very small in stature. (laughs) Yeah, I I didn't really have a lot to say about him either. I was just curious. I mean, he's a fun villain. Um, He's wonderfully despicable and aptly named for a man who is hunting a rat. (laughs) <laughs> um, and he's greedy. I mean, he's come up with this concept of microwave meals after the Gusto name. And ultimately, his his motivation is that he's worried that Linguini will take over and end his business ventures uh, because of his rightful ownership of the restaurant. And uh, I mean, like you said, the, the stature is a big comedic point. And I mean, I w- and this is another character who I wouldn't have guessed the voice of if I didn't know the cast list. This is Ian Holm who Mm. is most known for Bilbo in the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, I think. I mean, that's what I know him from. Yeah, Um, yep. So, yeah, I mean, he's a a fun villain. He's he's not the ultimate villain, uh, but he he does have his moments within the film. And the the motorbike chase, or the scooter chase, is is a lot of fun. Yes, it is. So, yeah, I probably undersold him a little bit. I mean, he he does have some motivation and everything. But, yeah, overall, uh, Skinner is not... I really like Ego so much, he, he overshadows Skinner. For me, every time I watch the movie, I'm kind of like, okay, we got to do this Skinner stuff right now. But really, I just want to see ego like sneer at people. I don't disagree at all. And uh, (laughs) I I will say that what's a Pixar movie without a John Ratzenberger appearance? And (laughs) he he appears as the head waiter, Mustafa. Uh, And it's another different kind of role because, once again, he's putting on an accent beyond just the typical John Ratzenberger voice. And uh, I like that a lot. Yep, for sure. And he's in it a little bit more than he typically is for 
a John Ratzenberger role. So that's fun. Yeah, that's very true. Well, let's move on to music. So uh, Michael Giacchino, what do you have to say about his score for this one? I just, I can't get excited about Michael Giacchino and, you know, just ho-hum. No. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, people who don't know me that well may not know that that was a a terrible joke. I love, I love and obsessed and I'm obsessed with uh, Michael Giacchino. I love all of his work. And uh, this is, this is one of those scores that, again, didn't overwhelm me at first. This is one that's taken a while for me to listen. I mean, I really have to listen to it and, and savor it, and it's grown on me over the years. One of the things that helped me appreciate and get into dig into this score more than, than some of his others was a special feature on the Blu-ray. This is one of the coolest special features I've ever seen on a disc, and I, I wish that this was done more often. So the the... The paper chase uh, track, which occurs during that that motorcycle or the the moped chase when Skinner is trying to chase down Remy, who's got the will. So it's it's that big, very tense chase scene that's a lot of fun. Originally, Michael Cicchino conceived of that that track as a little bit lighter and airier and and more comedic um, score. It sounds almost like something from The Incredibles. Like life is life is good again, or whatever that track is from the Incredible. Life is incredible it sounds again. almost like that. Yeah, life is incredible again. Right, of course, uh, puns. <laughs> um, but yeah, it um, it sounds almost like that. Brad Bird didn't really like that. He wanted that the that chasing to feel a little bit more intense. So the special feature on the Blu-ray, you can watch this scene and you can switch back and forth between the original composition that Giacchino had conceived of and the one that's in the final cut, and that's listen really to them. Cool. Yeah, one after the other. It's so fascinating to watch these scenes and see exactly how the music affects the score uh, or affects the affects your your uh, emotion. Of course, the music affects the score. It is the score. Um, but yeah, it, it that's a fantastic special feature. And that was the first thing that, that made me see like, hey, I need to dig into this a little bit more. I need to I need to listen to this more carefully because um, it's maybe not as flashy of, of, a, of a score as something like The Incredibles, which I adore. But this one definitely, this score definitely conjures up a uh, the spirit of Paris. It's very romantic. It's very airy. But I also love that there are little motifs that have a sense of urgency that occur every time we're in a busy kitchen scene. The tempo heats up. And again, as someone who worked who worked in the kitchen, who worked in a restaurant, you know, I can kind of it almost t- kind of takes me back to when I when I used to wait tables and, and <laughs> gets me in it gets me in that spirit or that mood. So, yeah, I really think this is one of his underappreciated scores and um, it was underappreciated by me. And I think it's worth digging into uh, more and more. But you're the music guy. <laughs> It's impossible for me to really point out a favorite Giacchino Pixar score in particular, just because they are all so good from Incredibles to up to Inside Out to this one. Am I missing one in there? Oh, Cars 2. Yeah. Yep. I mean, they're all very, very good scores. And that being said, this is definitely a contender for possibly the best. Um, I just love the variety of it. You know, Michael Giacchino, I've said it before, I think is the most, uh, one of the most, well, Yeah, I'll go ahead and say it. I think that Michael Giacchino is the most talented composer working today just because of how adaptable he is. I mean, even just within those Pixar scores, there's so much variety and there's so much contrast between what he can do from setting to energy to all those kinds of things. And this one is so Parisian in sound. It's got jazzy stuff. It's got just typical orchestra stuff. It's got this uh, almost sense of improvisation sometimes, which I really mm. noticed in the track Special Order, which is appropriate yep. because that's when Linguini, or more accurately, Remy, is improvising on Gusto Sweetbread recipe. And it, it sounds straight up like imp- improvised jazz. Uh, mm. it, it's really cool. And then you can also hear stuff like, there, there's like a rat motif, motif, I think. You first hear it in the, the, the track This Is Me. It's played by the bassoon. And to me, it sounds like rats scurrying along. And then you have the energy of a track like Colette shows him La Ropes, where you're just being whisked around the kitchen and she's giving rule after rule after rule and tip after tip. And it's just fast paced, like you said. And it, man, Giacchino is so good. He just encompasses everything about the film uh, so well. And it has one of the, one of my favorite end credit tracks as well, end credit twoies. 
Yeah, I mean, Michael Giacchino is one of my favorites, and yeah, it, it's it's hard to say anything beyond just wow, this is a great score. And if you aren't familiar with it, because you're only familiar with stuff like Incredibles or uh, Up, then you should definitely check this out because it it is one of my favorites by him. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, I am no musician, <laughs> far from it. But if someone made me choose just on my own preference and and <laughs> I, I genuinely would pick Giacchino over John Williams if I could only listen to one I truly would um, and that, I mean that in no way as a slight to John Williams because he is a master but there is something about Giacchino that like you said I think it is his his he is so versatile um, and there is something about his music that moves me not that John Williams doesn't but, but I don't know Giacchino uh, he gets me in some way I certainly won't argue. I, I love myself some John Williams. Uh, I love myself some Michael Giacchino. I won't make quite the statement, <laughs> not at this point at least. Uh, but man, Giacchino's great. Yeah, he is. Now let's move on to our relevance and takeaway section. So, what's your first takeaway from this movie? Well, <laughs> it's interesting because I, I took none of this away almost when when I watched the film for the first time. And again, like I said, movies grow on you. But part and parcel of this being a Brad Bird movie is that it has a bunch of common themes. Brad, Brad Bird works with a ton of common themes, yet every time he works with common themes and ideas, they always feel fresh and insightful. This one especially, so for me personally. One theme that I can obviously point out is would be the theme of the underdog. Although underdog doesn't quite do it with, with Brad Bird. I feel like it's almost like, in Brad Bird films, the nobodies win the day. Um, or you could put it this way. I think maybe this is closer to what Bird does. Um, Bird creates films with characters where the people we think are least likely to help us, or sometimes even the people or things we villainize are capable of great things and can even be the source of our redemption. Um, our life, um, or our sustenance, right? Or just our joy. Um, so people we think that are least likely to help us end up, end up saving the day, end up contributing to society and life, um, to make things flourish and, and prosper. I mean, we can think about just very quickly. We can think about the iron giant. The giant is himself villainized. Um, he's labeled as a gun, and he can be nothing more than that. And everyone fears him, and everyone wants to destroy him. And, of course, it's the giant who ends up giving himself for humanity, right? Who ends up becoming Superman and saving everyone. In The Incredibles, at the time the bulk of the action in The Incredibles takes place, everyone has written off superheroes. They're a thing of the past. Um they're not doing their thing anymore. They need to be policed um, and shut down. And so nobody thinks that they're capable of really doing anything other than just being in hiding. Um, and including some of the superheroes think that. Bob Parr certainly thinks that uh, at the film's open. In Tomorrowland, George Clooney's character, Frank Walker, is early on. He's rejected by uh, Hugh Laurie's character, I'm forgetting his name right now, but he's rejected by him, you know, when he brings his cool little jetpack invention. Um, but he's rejected. He's turned away. Um, he's told that his you know work is, is no good. This is a common theme here in Ratatouille. We have Remy, a rat. Well, rats aren't supposed to be in the kitchen. It's gross. It's nasty. Nobody wants to see that. Um, and Bert even adds another layer to that because of the fact that we're the ones repulsed. It's not just people in the film world who are repu repulsed by rats being in the kitchen. We actually in the real world are repulsed by that. Um, so it's got this extra layer of self-awareness in there. Um, Linguini, like I mentioned earlier, he's a garbage boy. He's nobody, right? Um, so you've got these two characters, Remy, a rat, um, who's not supposed to be in the kitchen, is supposed to eat whatever he can cook and he could cook really well better than any of the humans um and linguini who's a garbage boy is actually the heir to the restaurant like you know he's the son of of the most famous chef um even if he doesn't end up leading everything but these characters take the day this is something brad bird returns to again and again and again um so that's one thing i think i can point out there are of course a couple others but i'm gonna stop and let you jump in 
<laughs> it's also uh, the idea of being who you choose to be. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that's another common Brad Bird theme, whether it's the Iron Giant, and that's a verbatim quote, you are who you choose to be. Mm-hmm. Or whether it's the Incredibles and the the superheroes deciding, you know, it you may have rejected me at some point in time, but I am a hero. It's what I do. It's what my powers are for. And so I'm going to be the hero. Or uh, Tomorrowland, it's about being a dreamer, about being a creative person. It's about going out and doing things to be- make the world better. You are who you choose to be. And that, that is certainly prevalent here with mm-hmm. Remy especially. Uh, but even Linguini, you know, he... The, the restaurant closes at the end, but that's almost a, a, a freeing action for Linguini because he's able to do his own thing separate from the name of his father, which is a very cool thing. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I really like that. And then just talking about criticism again, uh, I won't go too deep into this because we already did a little bit unless you want to add more to it. But again, critics don't aim to hate the things they review. They want to love them, and that's why they exist. That's why they do what they do. Criticism is about loving things and wanting them to be better as a result of your observations. Um, And just speaking of criticism and ego himself, uh, the fact that this Ratatouille takes him to a place of his childhood, a place of vulnerability, this idea of how experiences can simultaneously be memories. I I love this notion that this simple dish, this peasant dish, as it's referred to, takes this this harsh critic back to the innocence of his childhood in a time when he was comforted by the food his mother made him. And it's it's just a beautiful moment, this idea that uh, food or really any experience can take us back to any point in time. Mm -hmm. Because art is influenced and affects our is influenced by and affects our memories. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just add a little bit to your criticism conversation, if that's okay. Uh, Because I, I find this to be tremendously helpful, challenging and encouraging all at the same time. Um, To me as someone who I never know where to put the label of whether I'm a critic or, or what it is I do, but I enjoy thinking and writing and talking about movies, obviously. Um, so I can label myself broadly in that, um, in that category. And there's really the ego character is in this movie so that Brad Bird can have a very honest conversation with not only artists, he does that. And I'll talk about that too. But, but with critics. And the theme that pops up in this movie really is that criticism should be criticism should be thoughtful, it should be filled with passion, and it should be authentic. And you kind of break those three down, thoughtful, filled with passion, and authentic. One, it should be thoughtful because, like we talked about before, and like Ego says, it is easy to write negative reviews. And I can't watch this movie anymore without turning the lens inward on myself, which is what Brad Bird, I think, wants us to do, um, is, is look inside our own lives, even if we're not critics, even if we're not art critics, even if we're not food critics or any of these things. We can apply these, we can apply these principles to our own lives. Um, it is so easy to write negative reviews. And... I love that ego uses that word easy and he also uses the word fun. It's easy and fun to be able to write negative reviews of things. Um, You can apply that to any, any situation. It doesn't have to be writing. Um, It's easy and it can be fun to gossip about people. It's easy and it's fun to, you know, blast somebody else's opinion. Right. Um, all of those things are easy and they can be a lot of fun to do. Um, but the problem is, especially when we're talking about criticism and especially when we're talking about film criticism and, and art criticism and all of these things is it's not, it's not authentic. Um, it's not an earnest work. It's not a life giving work because like the ego character says, in fact, I wrote it down cause it's so good. I love his final, I love his final speech. I'm going to read part of it because I can't, I can't help but, but read it. it it's, it's so fantastic. Please do. Um, he says, this is how he starts his review. He says in many ways, the work of a critic is easy. 
We risk very little, yet enjoy a position over those who offer up their work and their selves to our judgment. We thrive on negative criticism, which is fun to write and to read. But the bitter truth we critics must face is that in the great scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criti- criticism designating it so. Um, that last line is incredible. There are so many conversations, and it seems like contemporary film criticism is always reduced to determining whether a film is quote unquote good or bad. And we really want to do exactly what you say we don't do in this podcast. (laughs) We want to assign ratings and rankings. We want to rank stuff. We want to assign ratings. Um, We need to be able to figure out whether a movie is good or bad. And so we argue about that all the time. Um, And this idea that the average piece of junk, um, let's say a Michael Bay movie because it's easy, it's easy to lambast Michael Bay, and I've been guilty of doing. And by the way, I'm guilty of doing all of this. Oh, same here. Um, I've done that's it why, in the past as well. That's why it's hers. Like the average Michael Bay movie is more meaningful than our criticism designating it a piece of junk. Um, how much better would our time as critics, as thinkers, as people be <laughs> be spent if we if we took the time to actually interact with a text in meaningful ways? This is something that's just been on my mind for the past year or so, really. Um, I, it's easy for me to get caught up in this cycle of criticizing movies um, and just saying, oh, this is bad. This is terrible, you know, because it can be fun. It can be enjoyable, especially when you've got other people around you who want to do it, too. Um, but we're risking nothing if we do that. Um, and we're really producing nothing meaningful, I think, is the crux of the matter. Um, and this movie really shows that. I mean, the Anton Ego's character is static for most of the movie. There's no arc to his character. He's just sitting there like a vampire in his room. Um, and he's got all of the old nasty things he's written about restaurants, you know, filed away in a drawer and he loves to sort of pull them back out and read them. Uh, and he gets, he gets joy from that. Um, and man, it, it, frankly, it hurts because I feel like I resonate with that so much in so much of my work and I don't want to. Um, so yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to make this like a person. I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to make this like a psychotherapy session. Um, but yeah, that's not what criticism should be. Criticism should be interacting with and appreciating art in meaningful ways. Um, it doesn't mean that you call bad things good or anything like that, but you can also be thoughtful about the way you do it the way you do it. Um, and I think we all, and again, I'm certainly including myself with this. It's just important to be careful of the, and, and be mindful of the rhetoric that we use when we, when we talk about movies that we don't like, because creativity, like I'm, and, and this, this is another theme. So I'm just going to go ahead and bridge the gap. <laughs> creativity takes passion, authenticity, and hard work. This is something this film like gets at in a number of different ways. Um, to be a creator means to give something of yourself, right? That's, that's like, if you're, if you're creating genuine art, be it food, paintings, movies, music, whatever you're giving of yourself, um, to create something, to be an artist is to be very vulnerable. Um, anybody who's written anything, and I use that as an example because that's what I can relate to, it feels very vulnerable. You are putting your thoughts out there for other people to judge. Um, certainly if you make a film, you're doing that. Um, and when you're talking about a film, you're talking about something that, hun- especially if it's a Hollywood film, um, you're talking about something that hundreds, maybe thousands of people worked on for years. Um, worked overtime, right? had to neglect their families for periods of time in order to do this, maybe had to travel, had to do all of these different things in order to bring this. this is, and, and this is something hopefully that they're passionate about, but it's, it's a sacrifice that they have to make and they're giving of themselves. And then it's so easy for us as critics or as fans or whatever to just say, Oh, that movie's crap. Um, and I think it's important for us to think about you know, how we would feel if somebody said that about something we took time to write. Um, something we put hours and hours and hours in, um, it wouldn't feel good and it doesn't feel good. And we probably all have that happen to us. Um, and so frankly, there's a little bit of sting with watching this movie. Cause I'm like, why do I do that? Why do I get joy from that? 
Um, but I think it also offers up some encouragement for ways we, we can change that. Right. Um, and one piece of advice I think it offers or one suggestion I think this movie gets at maybe is that we shouldn't think that there is such a sharp divide between critic and artist. And I believe it's A.O. Scott who says the very, uh, the very same thing in his most recent book about film criticism. Um, but basically the, the critic is an artist, right? Um, to create a piece of criticism to write is, or, or to podcast or whatever is, is itself an art form. It's to give of yourself. Um, so we have to think what, what part of ourself are we giving here? Are we giving something that's just in, entirely vehement? Um, and again, there's, there's a balance there because we should be able to look at a Michael Bay movie and be like, okay, well, this is pretty explosion-y. Maybe this isn't the greatest thing in the world. Um, but how can we do that in a, in a kind and respectful way and still, and still interact with that text, that film in a meaningful way? Um, I'm rambling on and on. I feel terrible about it because you (laughs) have two slides. So I apologize. (laughs) Um, This is just something that has been on my mind for a while now. So it's fun to get to talk about it. I want to echo you 100%, you know, and it's why I started Cinescope. It's because I got tired of that rhetoric. I got tired of uh, going to see bad movies and then just raking them on Twitter for being bad movies or reading other people who are doing the same thing or looking at other people who are podcasting about that. And we're strictly talking about bad movies uh, for the sake of having fun, uh, making fun of bad movies. I, I just, I don't get that anymore. I maybe did it a time, but Cinescope was all about let's celebrate artists and mm. making things and being inspired by things. And so I, I think that this movie uh, teaches that as well, letting yourself being inspired by something, whether it's by creation of something else or just by other people in general or by your own passions, etc. I mean, it goes on and on by the things that you can be inspired by. In this movie, Remy is inspired by Gusto and the, the possibility of new, uh, new combinations that haven't been found yet. Just the possibility. Uh, he's inspired by possibility, to say it simply. And then, mm-hmm. then Guini... It, I think he says it as a joke at first, but ultimately I do think he's inspired by his love for Colette. Uh, mm-hmm. It becomes his focus as the film goes on because uh, it's something that he can rely on beyond his own cooking skills, which are non-existent. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. So she's is some, she is somebody who supports him beyond just Remy and he is inspired by that and he strives to be better because of that. And then you can also be inspired by just simple things. Ego is inspired by this peasant dish, ratatouille. It's, mm-hmm. it's steamed veg- steamed vegetables, basically. <laughs> and uh, eating that dish, he's transported back to a memory from his childhood where he was comforted and where he was vulnerable. It's just like you were talking about. Critics, uh, writing, putting art out there makes you vulnerable. And eating this dish, this very simple thing, sent him back to that moment of vulnerability in his life. And it rocks his world, as he says, to the core. And... After that, yes, he gets fired, <laughs> but he he's not uh, wallowing in misery. He's he's joyous. He he returns to uh, Remy day in day out to have more of the same dish because it reminds him of his own vulnerability and a time or, and how memory and experience can be comforting in their own respects. So yeah, all of that I like, and then just the the basic idea of adding something to the world, whether rather than accepting what's out there if there's an area that you think that is lacking go out and add to it if you think a movie is bad you don't have to tear it down go out and uh uh offer criticism to improve or Mm -hmm. make something of your own even i mean it doesn't have to be a movie necessarily i mean uh it it just has to be something that's 100 percent authentically yours and that is adding that adds to the world um there's a, a phrase mentioned throughout the entire film, this this quote, anyone can cook. And mm-hmm. Ego talks about how he disagrees with it at the very start of the film. But then in that review that he leaves for Gusto's at the end of the film, he says, I only now truly understand what Gusto meant when he said anyone can cook. It's not that mm-hmm. necessarily everyone can become a great artist, but 
that a great artist can come from anywhere. And even at the start of the film, Gusteau says that uh, the, the, the outstanding cooks, the ones who really stand out are the ones who put all, put their all into their work, who, who make choices, who are brave, who aren't afraid to fail. Uh, so all of these things, putting it into something that is yours, uh, anyone can cook, anyone can write, anyone can sing, anyone can dance. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can achieve 100% greatness. It just means that being you is the best you can do. And so you should do that with all of, all of you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, Gusto says, or not Gusto, Ego says in the, in the end of his letter, another thing he says is there is a time and I'm paraphrasing here, but basically there is a way that a critic can, um, can risk something and it's in defense of the new and really in essence boiled down. What that is saying is by, by being authentic, by being an authentic critic. Um, so as a as a critic, that's that's what I strive to do uh, all the time, and I fail in striving to do all the time. Is like what you like, don't like what you don't like. Be nice about it. Like you said, offer up constructive criticism, um, but be thoughtful, be respectful, um, and then be passionate about about what you love. Um, and this is something that is not easy to do. None of this is me saying I've got it figured out because I clearly don't. Um, but a bit more on the creativity side, because I do think criticism has to, should should be creative. The best criticism is creative, and it is an art form in and of itself, like A.O. Scott says. There's a uh, beautiful scene early in the film when Remy gets separated from his family, and he's in the sewers, and he just sits there for a while, like on on the, like some sort of like bank on the side of the uh, the sewer, until you know uh, Jiminy Cricket Gusto pops into his. <laughs> <laughs> into his mind and so he's just sitting there feeling sorry for himself oh you know like my, my cookbook is wet you know this is terrible my, i'm separated from my family things are never going to get better and gusto sort of prompts him to get up and come, climb out of the sewer and again accompanied by a gorgeous score he gets up and he gets up on the rooftop and realizes he's in paris and he's looking at the eiffel tower at night and it is a gorgeously animated scene um, and I feel like that scene is what I certainly can be like in my day to day life, trying to be creative. Um, how many times am I like Remy, you know, content to sit down in the muck and the mire and the stench of things and think about how bad everything is and, you know, this and that, and just, and, and be full of self pity when the world around me, or in Remy's case, right above me, um, is filled with so much beauty, right? Um, how much better would we be if we if we if we you know looked up <laughs> looked up stopped navel gazing and and looked at the beauty that is around us and made the most of, of that um so yeah i i find this film really inspiring and and really really challenging on on a number of levels um i i yeah anyways <laughs> <laughs> I agree, and I, I want to clarify as well. I'm not saying with Cinescope I've figured it out. I'm saying with Cinescope oh, no. I am trying to figure it out. Uh, yeah, no, and I was actually going to say earlier, I feel like you're doing a great job, Cinescope doing this, and I'm not just saying this because you had me on, but you really are. Um, it's encouraging to hear. I mean, Aaron Aaron White at Feeling Film you know, is is doing a good job with this. There are a lot of people out here doing this sort of thing, being being very positive. And it really is refreshing. Um, I think that's why you're able to find an audience because people do just get sick about of, hey, let's make fun of movies um, for an hour, an hour and a half. Right. Thank you. I love movies, too. And so I am I am out here to to find the best of them and maybe even find those underdogs that aren't as appreciated as they should be. So, yeah. With that, I think that's the end of the official 55th anniver er, anniversary. <laughs> and with that, I think that is the end of the official 55th episode of Cinescope. Thank you so much, Blaine. I was glad to talk about another Brad Bird film with you. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. When you said 55th anniversary, I thought, oh, crap, I got way too excited and like talked for 100 years or something. <laughs> Not <laughs> 50 quite. 50 years. <laughs> no, thank you. It was a lot of fun. And uh, Incredibles 2 comes out, what, next year? So yes. uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and just put you on the slate. 
<laughs> okay, I will take you up on that. Excellent. Contact for the show, facebook.com slash Cinescope Podcast and at Cinescope Pod on Twitter. Please, it's been a while since we've been rated and reviewed on iTunes. So if you haven't done that and you like the show, head over there or the podcast app on your iOS device and just leave a brief review letting us know what you think because it's a great way to boost the show on iTunes itself. And if you have any feedback or ideas, you can send those to our email, thecinescopepodcast at gmail.com. And if you're interested in co-hosting, if you have a movie that you love that you'd love to talk about, let me know through that email address as well. Now, Blaine, what are all the places, all the podcasts that people can find you on? Sure. Well, you can find me at realworldtheology.com. You can find a podcast there, some writing there, also at christandpopculture.com. But a couple of things that are newer that I don't think I was doing when I was here last time. One, um, I have a Star Wars podcast that I co-host with my good friend Josh Crabb. It is called Home One Radio. Um, Spell out the one. And it's a Star Wars podcast where we we don't focus on Star Wars news or anything like that. We really try to analyze the stories of Star Wars. Um, it's a weekly podcast, and we try to be fairly accessible to newer Star Wars fans as well as uh, older fans. So you can check us out at Home One Radio. You can also check out a brand new podcast that I've started with Aaron White of Feel and Film, and my wife also is a co-host on there. It is called Tabletop Flicks. This is where we get to join two of my loves, uh, movies and board games. And we kind of plan out a board game night um, for a a board game and a movie night. We pick a board game and a movie that are related um, in theme. And we we talk about them both together. Um, And again, we try to make that accessible for maybe hardcore board game people who sort of like movies and for people who love movies and are kind of interested in board games we try to hit that balance so those are some newer things you can check out if you feel so inclined i don't know if i had told you this i told aaron but after listening to your first episode of tabletop flicks i went out and i bought pandemic on my ipad and then after that i went and bought the board game Uh, i'm not at all a board gamer i had three different versions of Catan, i think (laughs) <laughs> but aside awesome. from that and the the traditional family games, I just hadn't dove into that genre very much. So uh, if, if the trend continues, I'm probably going to be a very poor man, but I'll have lots of board games. So <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I appreciate your, your listening. Definitely. Go check those out. The best place to find me is at Chadadada on Twitter. That is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A and Facebook.com slash Chad.Hopkins. And all the show notes and all the contact information for the show can be found at thecinescopepodcast.com. And just real quick, don't forget about our new The Office podcast called An American Workplace. Episode 5 will be released the same day as this episode. So if you want to go back, we're covering two episodes of The U.S. Office each week. Uh, We are so far on episodes three and four of season two. And then next week will be five and six. So go check that out rate and review that show on itunes as well to help us out as we're starting out and with that i think that's all for this week thank you once again blaine for being on the show it's always great to talk about movies in general and especially brad bird yes thank you and thank you everyone for listening to episode 55 i'm chad hopkins this was cinescope and we'll be back next week with episode 56 have fun and celebrate movies (laughs) 